My name is David Sankel. I'm from Bloomberg. And this is a talk. It's titled, uh, C++ 17's STUD PMR comes with a cost. So before we get started, I want to know how many of you have screwed around with STUD PMR? Raise your hand. OK, I see three, four. How many of you have screwed around with STUD PMR and actually used one of the custom allocators that come in the standard, like monotonic buffer? Raise your hand. How? It's not in any standard library. <laughs> it's not in any standard libraries. It was a trick question. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's 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 not imp these custom things aren't implemented in the standard library. What's that? Oh, maybe, but it's not in any standard library. Okay, so that's a good answer. Pablo had a reference implementation, apparently. All right. So uh, there's a lot of code in this talk, and here are two links. If you want to follow along uh, on your laptop, you can grab the code. So uh, for those who want to do that, I'll give you a second. Uh, and you're going to want to sit up close to be able to read the code um, if you have any trouble seeing stuff from far away. Those two links do go to the same place, yeah. All right, so there are two general themes to this talk. And this is orthogonal to Arthur's talk, which he gave uh, earlier today. The first is how to use PMR. This is a very practical talk on how you use this kind of thing in real life. Uh, and then once we're kind of all built up to the idea of how you would use PMR, we're going to talk about its implications. OK, now we understand this tool. We understand how it's used. When would we want to use it? It's a good idea in the first place. So the first thing I want to, uh, we're going to discuss is the problems that STUD PMR attempts to solve. Um, the first one is that allocation is slow. So if you've ever run a performance and analyzer on a program, you're trying to figure out what the hotspots are and clean it up, Probably the most frequent thing that you see, at least the first time you're on the performance anal analyzer, is all of your time being spent in allocation. There could be a, like a stood vector being created in an inner loop, something along these lines. Usually the way to solve this problem is just move the, move the thing out of the inner loop and reuse data rather than reallocate every single time. Um, but generally, allocation is slow. so. We really care a lot about performance. So STUD PMR tries to address these performance issues. The second is that fragmentation hurts performance. So I'm going to use the chalkboard here. The idea behind fragmentation is let's say I have a vector of some kind of object. And throughout the course of a long running program, I uh, allocate new objects and throw them back to the vector. If I look at the placement in memory where these objects get created, if it's a long running program, I might have one thing over here, one thing over here, one thing over here. And the reason why this is a problem is that if I have to scan through this vector, I need to jump all the way over here in memory, all the way over here in memory, then here, then here. And each one of these uh, can potentially require the cache line on the CPU to be re-pulled from memory. So if you can get rid of the fragmentation and say, hey, you know, these objects that I'm creating, um, they're all going to be kind of clustered together uh, in terms of the time that I access it. Um, and then you have something more along these lines. When I iterate through the vector, I might be able to grab like a whole bunch of these in the cache line, and it'll just improve the performance a lot. So fragmentation's, in my mind, probably the most important reason as to why allocators are important. And the third thing, about STUD PMR, the, the problem that it's trying to solve or address, is that pre-C++17 allocators in the standard are overly complicated. So first, it's that they're complicated. Uh, and they're so complicated that hardly anybody uses them. Uh, and hardly even fewer actually understand them. I can think of only like a handful of people on the off the top of my head that actually understand the ins and outs of the standard allocator model. Um, but the thing is that they're overly complicated, in which you know you don't actually need all the complication that they have. There's a lot of options with the C++ 98 style allocators that nobody really needs in practice. So STUD PMR kind of uh, cuts down the feature set in order to get something which is extremely useful but simple as well. So when we talk about speed, these are the three uh, 
resources, memory resources that are provided in C++ 17 standard library. And as I mentioned before, uh, these are not implemented in any of the uh, standard library vendors, well, at least Clang and GCC. I don't know about uh, Visual C++. Um, but they're going to be there. And the first one is called synchronized pool resource. So when would you use this kind of a memory resource? And we'll see how memory resources are used in a minute. But if you have data which is frequently accessed at the same time, so kind of like this, this scenario that I had here, if you're iterating through a vector of things like pointers or whatever, um, you can create one of these resources and say allocate all these objects with this resource and they will generally uh, be located in the same kind of area in memory, right? So that it can actually have a quite a significant boost in performance if you use something like this. The second one, unsynchronized pool resource, you would use this in the case that you're, uh, maybe you're writing a multi-threaded application with like a worker pool and you know it pulls out a piece of work, but you know that that work is only gonna be accomplished on a single thread, then you don't need to uh, have that overhead of um, the synchronization of multiple threads having using the same allocator, right? You, if you know that only one thread is going to be using this allocator, then you can have things that are you can have a more performant allocator essentially. So that's what this one is for, that unsynchronized pool resource. And the third one is the monotonic buffer resource. So uh, what you get with this one is very high speed at the expense of a high amount of space usage. So if you if your memory access patterns fit this, it's it's wonderful to use. Basically, the idea is you say you have a chunk of memory and um, I allocate something and you just allocate it at the beginning of that memory and then I want to allocate something else. So I allocate it right after that. Now let's say this one gets deallocated. Well, it never gets reused in a monotonic buffer resource. That memory is just gone forever. And then you just keep on allocating over and over again. Uh, and the idea is, is that the cost of that allocation with a monotonic buffer resource is just basically incrementing a pointer, right? So it can be extremely fast. Uh, but again, if you're going to be you know, constantly allocating and deallocating stuff, then you're going to use up this memory pretty quickly. But generally, that's when you use these things. So there are three very useful tools that you can uh, use to tweak out performance. Uh, but this isn't actually the concentration on this talk. Um, I'd like to talk about the simplicity. And the first thing with simplicity is what does it take to make a new memory resource? So here we're defining a new memory resource called logging resource. And generally when you're defining these things, the most frequent case is that you're writing a memory resource uh, transformer, right? You're, you're implementing your memory resource in terms of another resource. So in this case, um, you implement these three member functions. Uh, and one's called do allocate, one's called do deallocate, and one's called do is equal. And here, all this being done is that I'm calling the underlying resource, which got passed in, in the constructor, and calling those functions. The difference is that I added an uh, output statement here. So it just logs every time something is allocated and how much memory was requested. Make sense? All right. So let's use this. Um, so the, the comment was that you inherit because, and, and then pass in a member of the same type because that's a convention. Well, this particular, you, you don't have to do this, right? This isn't necessary. You do have to inherit from memory resources by making a new memory resource. But the reason why I'm passing in a memory resource in the constructor is because I'm using it in the implementation. I could potentially write an allocator which doesn't use any other allocator underneath the hood. And in that case, I would not pass in a uh, memory resource in the constructor. And the wrapper around it is not memory resource. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, just, I think yep. we're just going to mention this is for chaining so that you can propagate through. You don't have to do that if it comes from a fixed resource, but this is a slightly more general way of doing it. Right. Yeah, the comment was that you, you, this is a more general way to do it because this is a way to chain various things together, um, which is exactly correct. Okay, so using this memory resource. 
So the first thing that I do is I create my resource. Uh, I made it static. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then I called this function called set default resource. And I pass into it a pointer to the memory resource which I just created. Um, and then I use a PMR vector. So this is just like your std vector, except it's uh, polymorphic allocator aware. You can think of it like that. Um, and I push back a couple of ints to it. And I see right here that it's actually being used. So the first line, it says allocating four bytes. So that is what happened when I put the first ints in the vector. And then it allocated eight bytes because uh, previously its size was only one element. So it now doubled the size, as typically is done with the vector. And now it allocated eight bytes, one for the first int and one for the second int, and presumably it copies over the ints. So the general um, idea is that, or just like a general rule, is that whenever you're going to set the default resource, that thing needs to have a, a, a global lifetime. Now, can anybody think of a reason as to why it should have a global lifetime? Why couldn't I, why shouldn't I just make this like a, just a, a just a plain variable? Why do I have the static there? You could, you could still be logging on, or you could just still have uh, objects allocated in destructors after main possession. Because you could still have objects allocated in destructors. Destructors, De of, destructors of globals could still be allocating after main Oh, destructors of globals could be allocated after main access. Okay, so let's say before I ended main, I called set default resource to null, which just makes it the default one. Would that fix that problem? It would fix, it would fix that problem. Are there any other problems? Makes up sense. Well, are we assuming that everything got deallocated before you exited main? Um, are we assuming everything got deallocated before exiting main? I wouldn't assume. So really the reason is, imagine that I have another function which has a, st a member static in it, right? So a static uh, std vector, maybe d done for some kind of caching or something like that. If by calling, by creating this vector of int, it happened to call this function, and that function having a std PMR vector got created in it, then that static, which is global duration, has this allocator, right? But when does that thing get destructed? It gets destructed after main, like in the shutdown sequence. And if this allocator gets destructed before the thing which uses it gets deallocated, then boom, undefined behavior, right? So this is a subtlety that is really important to know. I've, I've seen a lot of bugs centered around this issue. Is this set uh, resource for all threads? Or is it just thread local? Does this set the resource for all threads, or is it thread local? This sets the, this is for all threads. So even a thread that's being detached would require this thing to live long enough to then actually push an end. Yes, even a thread which is detached needs to live long, this needs to live longer than its statically initialized goal. This is an important special case of a more general thing that when you create something using a uh, file scope static that allocates memory or does anything, uh, and you have multiple translation units, that is like the number one source of bugs that I've seen in an issue. Like that, that is the thing. When you start worrying about lifetimes of things where you're allocating things before main and after, oh my goodness, all. So this is an example of that. So the comment is, is that this is an example of the general uh, <coughs> frequent cause of bugs when you have like file scoped variables that are allocating at all. Yes. Um, and I will say that allocators in particular make that like even worse than, than before. Allocators make it like absolutely devastating when somebody th th puts this thing as local. I've seen a lot of this problem. the memory resource after everything that's using it has been deallocated. That's right. So if, for example, you had a stack-based version of these things, then that would be totally normal for them to have locally. 
So if you had a stack version of these things, well, well you, would, you would be able to set up the default resource for everything. For all yeah, when you set the default resource, that's basically setting it, sure it for, for everything. It's just the problem of that it escaped the lifetime of main because you set it as a global. That's it. Like it escaped the lifetime of wherever it was created if it weren't static. Correct. I'm, I'm glad folks are yeah, like getting this. that are then created that allocate memory before you call main or call any code? Does that mean you can't change their default memory allocator? Oh, that was a fantastic question. So the question is, what if I have statics and stuff that are uh, allocating before main? Does that mean that I can't set the default resource for them? The answer is yes. Yeah, you, basically, uh, that that isn't supported in this model. If there was like some kind of a pre-main like hook that you can jump into and, and set this, then that would be possible. But otherwise, it isn't. Wait, so you can only call uh, set default resource once main has started. Uh, call it from. Okay. <laughs> so now we're getting into like some really bad ideas of how to solve this. Um, so yeah, you could, for example, we, we know the tricks on how to be able to execute code before main, and some of that code which you execute before main is calling this function. However, if you have multiple translation units, the order in which those things are called is not like yeah. known. <laughs> Chandler? You can use create an array and get it to go before all of the constructor stuff. Wait, you can use what? Pre init? Okay, there's a comment that things run before global constructors yeah. that are standard? Yeah. Yeah? Because they are part of a standard. Okay, not, not C++ standard. All right, well, let, let's, for the sake of this discussion, stick to the C++ standard. So what you're saying there's also other languages out there, too. <laughs> you can check for equality. So in every translation unit where you want to set the resource, you could do it in that. No one else has said it. That's not All right, so, so I'm going I'm to move past this because this is, I mean, you guys are an intelligent bunch. You can figure out all kinds of nifty ways to shoot yourself in the foot. <laughs> the answer is don't do that, right? Always initialize your default resource in main if you're going to, and make sure that sucker's static. All right, <laughs> let's move on. I, this is going to be a long talk. <laughs> So here is a very basic kind of thing that you would do in C++. So we have, and, and we're going to use this example. We're going we're to dig our heels right into this thing. So first we have a class called bar. It has a string data member, and it's initialized to data. You can imagine other things going on in here, but for the sake of this discussion, it just has a string. You, you have a class called foo with a unique pointer to bar, and it's initialized to uh, std make unique of bar. All right, so there's nothing special going on with allocators right here. And then I have uh, somewhere else in the code, probably in main, uh, I output something, and then I just add two things to the end of this vector. Okay, and this is a PMR vector. So what do you think is going to be output here? So, so assume that we've set the global allocator, or the, the default allocator to the logging one. Any ideas? Something for the bar? Well, it's going to allocate 8 bytes, which is the size of foo. And then it's going to allocate 16 bytes, which is the size of two foos. Because I added one element to the vector, and then I added another element to the vector it had to resize and copy over. All right, so but I don't see. There were more allocations going on here, but it's not captured. I have one question um, on the PMR vector. Was it just uh, an alias for a vector with the uh, allocator, or is it like a? Uh, good question. So, std PMR vector is an alias to a std vector, but with the allocator set to the polymorphic uh, allocator. All right. So we want to have more like 
we want, we want this, this foobar thing to start using uh, the default allocator. So uh, the first thing to keep in mind is that we, do, we don't, can't use a normal unique pointer if we want to use a, the special allocator for this thing. If we use a normal unique pointer, then we'd get undefined behavior, right? Uh, so it's going to be a common theme through this talk. If you don't do the right thing, you get undefined behavior. That happens all the time with, when you're working with allocators. You, you have to do it exactly right. So I initialize bar with a null pointer. And this polymorphic allocator delete, I'll show you this on the next slide. Uh, just keep it, put it on your stack for now. And then here in the body of foo2, the constructor, what I do is I create an allocator using the default resource. So remember back in main, we set the default resource. This is a way to get the default resource. And one thing to keep in mind is that all these allocators, uh, uh, well, polymorphic allocator in particular, if you don't pass anything to the constructor, if you don't pass the resource you want it to use, it's going to use the default resource. Right? So in other slides, you'll see I actually allied uh, this argument to the constructor. But I just put it here for illustration purposes. Then I use the allocator, which I just created, to create a single bar2 instance. And then I construct it. So there's this two phase initialization when you're using allocators. First, you basically say, give me the memory to put this thing into. And second, you say, uh, initialize this memory, call the constructor. What's the parameter one? Oh, uh, the parameter one is saying I want one of these objects. If you had an array or a vector, you'd, you, know, you could put more. But generally, you just put one. And you said that if we don't do this, we have undefined behavior. If you, don't, if, if you have a unique pointer which doesn't have polymorphic allocator delete, just a plain unique pointer, you have undefined behavior because it's calling delete like global delete, as opposed to the delete in the allocator itself. Maybe I'm missing something. I don't see why it's an issue, right? We allocated the foo with the polymorphic resource, and then the unique pointer is dealing with bar on its own. What's the problem? Why is it then a Ah. Uh, switch. You said you're constructing bar in memory you got from the allocator. It's different from the previous example. Yes, but in the previous example, what I'm saying. So if, if, the, if the global memory allocator is the default allocator that likes installed when you start up? Yes. That actually won't be a problem, right? But we're trying to do this in a general way, where if somebody uh, sets the default allocator to something crazy, then if I call delete on the object, then I get the undefined behavior. You really want to make sure that delete is called for the allocator that you allocated it with. All right. Is there a potential memory leak here where you're holding on to bar the raw pointer, and you're not giving it to the unique pointer until after you call construct? <laughs> yes, very good observation, w which was that what if construct throws an exception? Oops, that's a problem. Uh, something different? I have something different. Why are you going to polymorphic allocator in the first place instead of using the resource directly and give you the translation you need to construct the object? Ah, why am I using the polymorphic allocator directly as opposed to using placement new? Um, I could have used placement new. I think that would have worked. But I, I think this is uh, the, the general style that people normally use with these things. The recommendation is that when you're going to try to use something that isn't the object's allocator, you use the currently installed default allocator. That is your global allocator. In other words, that's what you would use. You don't call new explicitly. You don't call the default allocator explicitly. You call the currently installed one. That way, when you're testing, you have control of it. I'm not going to repeat that, but it's true. So, so <laughs> since this is the default allocator, did we need to, to indicate polymorphic allocator delete in the unique point, pointer, or would that have been the default since this is the default allocator? Ah, so, all right, so technically speaking, we know that the new delete allocator got installed in main. So we could have went without this 
and it would have worked fine. But don't do that, right? This is again like where we get in trouble because as soon as somebody changes the default, al the default al allocator in main, now all of a sudden we have undefined behavior. So assume that we want this to be a generic class that doesn't depend on what main looks like, which is generally what we do anyway. So if, if construct throws mm -hmm. in the case that alloc on the stack will be cleaned up and therefore will release the main, could the allocation be ah. and then could construct be So if construct throws, this is just a plain pointer and it's already been allocated. There's nothing magic that's going to deallocate this thing. So alloc is on the stack, but it's basically a, it has a pointer to some mobile allocator. It's not being, the memory isn't being initialized in alloc. Yeah. Right. Good. Great questions, guys. All right. So, yeah, we got this exception safety problem. So you got to be smart about how you allocate these things. So here we we try the allocation. If that hap uh, the construction, if it threw an exception, then we deallocate it and then rethrow. So that way that allocation never gets leaked. Be careful when you use these things. <laughs> so this seems like a complicated way to get around, uh, to avoid using placement new. Not, not placement at a particular address new, but placement new to say where the memory is coming from. If you used, place, if you used a placement new expression that specified the allocator you're using, all this would be, the, the try thing would be handled for you. Oh, okay. So, so, so there's a comment that perhaps placement new can do this kind of stuff for you. Um, I'm not familiar with that. Perhaps it can. Is there a reason why we don't have PMR unique pointer? Uh, is there a reason why we don't have PMR unique pointer? You guys are like anticipating everything, <laughs> which is really great. Yeah, we could uh, have a PMR unique pointer. We could have a PMR make unique right to you know wrap all this stuff up that's certainly possible one of the goals was making it simpler than physical plus the unit unit i don't <laughs> think this is simpler than what's already there okay i have i have some comments that is not simpler than c plus plus 17. okay i feel compelled to say that all of what you're saying is true and all of this is dangerous and bad and if people did this the world would be a worse place the truth however is is that in production code one would never, ever replace the global allocator the way you're describing it here, ever. In testing, they would. And if you wanted to replace the global allocator, you would redefine it for the program in the, for in the uh, translation unit that defines main, full stop. So the comment is you would only ever replace the global allocator in the translation unit which defines main, but which I think is exactly what I said. No, no, no. Redefine it, not replace it. I mean, oh. at compile time, kick out new, put in your own new, your own allocator, your own global allocator for all time, but none of this. Okay, I, I think you're misunderstanding what's going on here. I'm not installing a new global allocator in I any of this code. I you're not, and I think that's the problem. <laughs> all right. I, I believe that was referring back to Lisa's uh, comment about could you do it with replacement new, but there I believe she's saying could you So it won't, it won't also protect you from bar two constructed throws either. Placement new is just allocating memory. It's not constructing bar. Bar's constructor happens in oh, the <laughs> But if you use a placement new, the new expression and the, the, try, the, the try catch. That would not be placement new. It would be the right. overload of the old regular. Yeah, but it's like. The, 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 the syntax is the same as placement new. The syntax is 
standard wording for that is it's still placement new. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> this, this, this conference is awesome. So a lot of discussion about placement new. I am really looking forward to seeing a presentation on that being used. This is not that presentation. I, I, I did not go, go down that path. So um, let's keep moving forward. So the polymorphic allocator delete thing that we passed into unique pointer. So for those of you who aren't aware, unique pointer second template argument is basically a callable, which will just be called on the pointer in the event of, in the event of a destructuring. So in reverse order and the way that we created this thing, we use the polymorph, well first we, we take a copy of the polymorphic allocator and keep it as a member. Um, but then when we call this to deallocate the pointer, we call first destroy and then deallocate. So remember there was the two stage initialization, allocate, construct, and now we destroy to destruct it and then deallocate. Pretty straightforward. Is it true that I mean, taken by logging there's no move there, will never be a good idea because polymorphic allocator moves semantics as a binding transfer copy? So there's a, a comment on move semantics. We're gonna go very deep into that. So Wait for it. There's a leak here too. Uh, there was a comment that there's a leak here too. If the destructor throws. Nice. You know. And delete expressions will handle that for you if you need to place it. So, as every time I go through these slides, I find a new bug. Keep that in mind. All right. Oh. I just want to ask you a question and not make a comment, but uh, are destroy and deallocate both no except? Uh, there's a question, are destroy and deallocate both no except? I would be very surprised if destroy was no except. <coughs> deallocate, I don't know. Uh, does this need to be modified to handle array uh, allocations? I don't know. <laughs> destroy is not no accept, so I don't. So the comment is that destroy is not no accept. Yes, that, that we know for sure. Uh, destructors are no accept by default. Yeah, the comment is the destructors are no except by default. Yes, in any sane program, destroy is not going to throw. But if you want to write a general purpose tool, then you probably need to propagate that and not leak. What do you do with a destructor? What happens if a destructor throws? Ah, so there's a question, what happens if a destructor throws? Now we're going towards like, if you write really trashy code, what are the implications when you do stuff? No, and no, 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 no. Oh, as a library lighter. Well, well, I think the thing that you can do is first, well, actually, that's really tricky, huh? Right. What do you do? Right. I don't know. So the comment is that you still need to deallocate the memory, but I wonder what state the original object was that had a. It doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> if you read the, the chapter of the standard on exceptions, there is a long section on stack unwinding, and a lot of people spent some time to figure out what goes on there, and it should do that. Okay, so there's a comment. The comment is that. Read the standard. It says something about this. <laughs> All right. So we have this thing. Now we're going to run this and see what happens. So now we're allocating 16 bytes. It was previously allocating 8 bytes. This is for the first, the first sized vector. Then we allocate 24 bytes, which is the size of bar 2. 
Then we allocate 32 bytes, which is twice the size of 16, because now we have to make room for two entries, and then allocate 24 bytes again for the second entry. So does anybody know why we went from 8 to 16 bytes? I don't need, even need to ask. Somebody knows. So the comment is that unique putter's bigger. Right, unique putter's bigger because this thing now has uh, an allocator in it, which is the size of a pointer. All right. Um, but note that this string inside of bar 2 is not using the default allocator at all, right? Because it's a std string. It's not a std PMR string. The question is, is this well-defined? Absolutely is well-defined. Yep, you can use different allocators, no problem. You can mix them. Uh, <laughs> 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 All right, so here we're changing the code to now use std PMR string. Great. So now it should use the global allocator. Do all standard types have PMR versions? Uh, the question is, do all standard types have PMR versions? Not all of them. Some of them do. String in the containers do, for sure. All right, so let's see what this is going to output. What do you expect? Well, this, the, when, when we allocate bar 3, this increased to 32 from 24. And then again, it happened over here. Why did it increase? Because now std PMR string has a pointer, right? It has its own allocator. But why didn't we see like the allocation for data here? Small buffer optimization. Small buffer optimization. Yes, exactly. Um, so the allocator isn't actually used in this case. Um, we just kind of like pay this extra allocator cost. All right. So you might think, well, I really shouldn't have to worry about storing this Thing right here, I know it's going to deallocate with the default allocator. So let's make, let's say, a default polymorphic allocator delete. In this case, it doesn't have any data member. It just has in its call operator grabbing the default allocator and calling destroy and deallocate, assuming we handle the exception thing according to whatever. Right? Is there such thing as a PMR unique pointer? Nope, not yet. Does that make sense? I say, does it make sense? Sure. I mean, I, I think that the committee would welcome a paper on something like that. I know I would. Um, so now we use default polymorphic allocator delete, and boom. Now we went back to 8 from 16 and back to 16 from 32. Is there any problem with this? <laughs> the comment is, what, yeah, what if you change the default allocator? Exactly. I create my foo4, and then somebody in main decided to change the default allocator. And now, when foo4 gets destructed, undefined behavior. So the, comment, the question is, can any expression change the default allocator at any time? I'm going to give this in two layers. First layer is the technical layer. Yes. The second layer is, the, in any sanely written program, you should not be changing the default allocator all the time. Um, I, I hope that nobody comes up with a good use case for changing the default allocator like mid-program. That would be bad. But you certainly don't want to write code which is going to break if that happens for some reason. I just have to say it one more time. In Bloomberg, we never change the default allocator in production code, ever. Now, if I'm wrong, tell me, and I will go find that person. <laughs> we never change it. And the reason for that is, especially in threaded code, unless you write your code for that purpose, you will die. And even our BDE code 
is susceptible to that problem. So the comment is, is that nowhere in Bloomberg's code, well, which I is, the word should. Sh should. <laughs> I totally agree with that. No code in Bloomberg should ever set the default allocator, except unless you're writing a test driver or something like that. Correct. Sure. Am I supposed to do this instead of passing a volumetric allocator as an argument to my construction? So the comment is, am I supposed to do this instead of having a, argument, a polymorphic allocator argument into your constructor? No. We're, we're building our way towards that. So what's the point? So the point of this is just to like get us acclimated with how these things work. So the comment is, yes, if, if so you de default construct a polymorphic allocator, then yeah. if that's the same thing as getting the default resource. You don't have to ask it. You can get to give a resource to one of your polymorphic allocators. You get two default resources. Okay. So this is a, the, the 16 by 20 by 20, this is a gotcha with unique prisoner, right? The, the custom deleter has to be stateless in order to get this 28 bytes or 16 bytes. Right? right, so the com. So, so the comment is that the allocator has to be stateless in order for this thing to be stateless. Um, I think it's true, but like more to the point though, to write the correct code, you need to keep around the allocator that you were constructed with in order to be able to destruct. Yeah. You, you never want to assume that like some global variable is staying the same throughout execution. How expensive is get default resource? The question is how Expensive is get default resource. I have not done any benchmarks on that. Um, I would presume that calling this function is something that will just be like inline, it'd mean nothing. I would assume it's an atomic pointer. Yeah. Comment was that assume it's an atomic pointer. I, that's probably right. All right. So moving on. Uh, so yeah, don't do this, All right? Please don't do this. Um, yeah, and here's just an example of the reason why we don't need to belabor that. So now let's talk about allocator awareness. So we figured out how to make this data structure, which is always going to be using the default allocator. But really, the whole point of this is that you pass in an allocator in a constructor which is special for your data type, right? Because the locality, as I mentioned before, is like the key feature of this whole thing. And you don't setting a global allocator isn't going to give you locality for anything. So the first thing we're going to do is for bar is we're going to take an allocator in the constructor and initialize the data member with that allocator. This is the common thing that you do. You take in an allocator in your constructor, you initialize all of your allocating data members with that allocator. That's most of the time. Sometimes you may have a a special allocator that you want to use for your data member, in which case you wouldn't pass the default allocator, you'd pass your specialized one, but, but generally this is what you do for most normal code. And then uh, same thing with all the CMR containers, if you didn't pass one in, they're just going to use the default one. And the comment is for the, for the PMR containers, if you don't pass one in, you're just going to get the default allocator. That's absolutely correct. <laughs> yep. All right. Um, and note here how I'm just using the default constructor, the allocator here as the default argument. So if you don't pass in an allocator to this bar six class, then it's going to use the default allocator. OK. So now in foo, we're going to keep a copy of the allocator that foo will get initialized with so that we can use it later. Um, and we do this before the unique pointer, because we may want to use it in our initialization. Now also in foo, um, you're going to do type def std PMR polymorphic allocator of byte. So in the previous talk, uh, it was suggested to use uh, void instead. I got no beef in that fight. I don't care, as long as it's something. Uh, it could really be anything. You do this to tell the rest of the standard library that you are allocator aware. That's how you advertise it, is you have this type def. And then we have a get allocator function. And this returns the allocator this object was constructed with. Please do not 
return something other than what the object was constructed with because you will get really bad undefined behavior. Now, when I'm, when I'm emphasizing these things, like the heat which I am emphasizing it, it is not out of theory. It is out of actual bugs and production code. Just follow the rules, please. And if you don't, uh, it hurts. These things are very hard to uh, debug if you don't do them right. You had the allocator as the first member in your class in the previous slide. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, th so the question is, should this be first or last for alignment reasons? And I don't think that there's like a, a general rule that you got to do one or the other. You have to look at the, the way that you're accessing your data type. I have a comment. First of all, alignment isn't the issue because when you have something that's maximally aligned, like a, like a pointer, it's a matter whether it's first or last. The, the thing is going to come to a construction. It's not an alignment. <coughs> so the comment is, there shouldn't be an alignment issue because you know, we got we got a 64-bit pointer, which would be first or last. If you would, put it in the middle, that would be dumb. Yeah, if you put if you put it in the middle, it would be dumb. But if you if you happen to have a data type where you frequently need to access the first, you frequently access access a particular data member, I can see putting that data member as first, just so you don't have to do with increment. It, it depends on your data type, right? This it's an engineering judgment. <laughs> so yeah, what's what's the what's the danger here? What where would people not get this right? I think that's the question. People not get this right when you use the allocator in your constructor to create another allocator, which you use to initialize your data members, and then people mistakenly return the other allocator that was constructed, not the one that was passed in the constructor. So you mean like prefabbed or like like a debugging allocator, like you said? Like a debugging allocator. Yes. Uh, so the question was, does this have to return by value? Uh, let's just say yeah. I mean, we're just talking a, a pointer. That's, that's all that this thing is. So it's safe to return by value. Do you want to put the allocator as a member after an object that has taken that allocator for purposes of deletion? Because if, if the allocator destructs, if the allocator is after a member, uh, it'll destruct before that member because that, that member depends on it. But if you were uh, okay. by So th th there's a little bit of confusion. The allocator is just a pointer. It's the memory resource underneath which holds the data. You know, you can create these allocators and destroy them, and that's totally fine as long as the underlying memory resource which they're pointing to doesn't get destroyed. So I it's fine whether you put this first or second or whatever. All right. So uh, the difference here in the constructor is that when we construct bar, we pass in the allocator to it. That's new. So we're, we're threading the allocator through into bar. And we're going to need a copy constructor. So here we have uh, a const reference that we're, that's passed in and an allocator. Basically, all of your constructors get an allocator argument, including your copy constructor. And again, we default here so we don't have to make multiple overloads. And we just do our assignment, no problem. And then we have an assignment operator here. Uh, that's pretty straightforward what that does. And then we have our move constructor. This is an important one. So in the move constructor, we basically have a check here to see if my allocator is the same as the other allocator, the thing on the right-hand side. If it is, then I can just say, OK, my pointer is now that pointer, and that pointer is now, well, let's just say null. We'll do the Sean Parent style and just, you, you can only destruct this thing. Uh, but you can imagine you know, having more complicated semantics here. All right. Um, otherwise, we need to initialize kind of like we did in the constructor. And then uh, I, I call operator equals underneath to, so I basically construct it as normal and then use operator equals to initialize it. So you have to see if the allocators are the same, then you can safely do this, this kind of move operation. Could you also have constructed and swapped in 
that sort of paradigm? Like you sort of Could you also have construction swap? So I'm not going to talk about swap. Swap is kind of like a sad story when it comes to polymorphic allocators. Um, but generally, this is, this is what you need to do if you want to like opt into like standard library stuff. Why do we need a size? I'm confused. I, normally, we, we avoid size and catches in our code. Why are we? So the co comment is, why do we have the try catch? Yeah, what's going on? Um, well, we talked about this quite extensively a, a few slides back. But just to, to reiterate, if bar's constructor throws an exception, I've already allocated the memory for it. So I need to make sure that I catch that exception to deallocate the memory and then rethrow that exception. If I got rid of this part and just had bar alloc.construct and it threw an exception, then this memory would, would leak. I think what he's suggesting is that you should do that with a unique pointer. You, I mean, it has to have oh. a special deleter on it. But it should be managed. <laughs> so the comment is it should be managed, right? If we had a std PMR unique pointer with a std PMR uh, make unique, that would make make us not have the need for this. It has to be a different one because it has to not destroy anything. It, it's a unique pointer that takes three. <coughs> so now we're like kind of like hypothesizing about what such a thing would look like. Um, so someone could seriously figure out how to do that. Uh, scope guard, but I have another question. Does it mean that this can never be null except unless the copy is not separate? Uh, so the, the question is, does this mean this can be no accept because the copy is no, no This can never be no accept so the, unless the copy is no uh, Yes, this, this can never be no accept because the copy is can accept. <laughs> All right. So, okay, so we have this basic thing here, and we're going to do our same uh, thing as before. We're just going to put two things into the vector. Anytime that you're using the PMR version of things, your move constructor is definitely no accept. So hold that thought. Okay. So here's what happens when I do this. So now uh, we have our 24 <laughs> bytes which we allocate, and then we have our 32 bytes uh, thing that got increased. So. Allocate first element of the vector, uh, vector of size one, put the first thing into it. Allocate a vector of size two, put the second thing into it. What is this? Where did this extra allocation come from? Copy constructor. Copy constructor. I heard that. Why, well, why was, what's going on here? Why is there a copy constructor being called? I got a move constructor. This, this, is, this is fun. So let's, let's talk about why we put move and no accept into C++. The motivating use case is that if you, actually, let me give you a hint. Who can tell me what strong exception safety is? John? Strong exception safety, according to the standard, is I believe if you don't, uh, if it doesn't succeed if an exception is thrown, no state in the program at all changes except when it does. <laughs> <laughs> so the comment is is that when an exception, I'm gonna I'm gonna say what it is. If an exception <laughs> is thrown in the course of calling a function, then all the parameters to the function, all the all the state is restored to what it was at the point that the function was called. So it's almost like, OK, like it never happened. And in the case of a vector, I've got my new buffer of memory. And I've got my old buffer of memory, which is smaller. The idea is, well, I'll move construct over here and over here and over here and over here. And we're all good to go. But the move constructor is not no accept, right? So that means that one of these can throw an exception. If it throws an exception, then how do I get back to the original state? You can't. Because um, you can't move them back. They could throw an exception. So you're just SOL. 
unless your move constructor doesn't throw an exception. And in this case, it does. So, so, so basically what's happening is, is Vector is seeing, oh, the move constructor is not no accept. So rather than move these things over, I'm going to just go ahead and copy them, which defeats the whole purpose of move and no accept. So strong exception safety. That's the problem. Um, and that brings us to PMR's dirty little secret. And that's this. With PMR, what you're supposed to do is in your move constructor, you make another move constructor, right? This one, no accept. And this one doesn't take in an allocator argument. And instead, what it does is when you initialize a foo7, it'll copy the allocator in the argument and initialize its allocator using that other allocator. And then everything else is the same. Okay. So this fixes the copying. Um, this has a lot of implications for move semantics. Uh, one thing is that before this dirty little secret, the move constructor directly corresponded to the move assignment, right? But in this case, the move constructor sucks the allocator of the right-hand side, the move assignment leaves it alone. Like it, has, it keeps its own allocator. So there's a distinction there. So that's kind of tricky and, and easy to get wrong. Uh, it, this, this actually took me a while to figure out uh, because there's a bug in both GCC and uh, Clang's standard libraries where this, there's some weird behavior with regard to this. But anyway, if, if we do this, then, and also note that I, I removed the, the, the default argument here, now we get back to having only four allocations and it's not doing a copy anymore. Um, but look at all this data. Right? And this was originally eight bytes. This was originally smaller. The reason why this thing has ballooned in size is because we have copies of these allocators all over the place. Right? And, and when you're talking about high performance code and you're talking about keeping stuff in the cache line, when you double the size of something or triple the size of something, that makes a big difference. Like, that's something that you care about because you can have your, your cache misses. So, Let's see if we can save the cache. Uh, j just so that we can, I, I've got this slide up so we can kind of enumerate what happened here. So we got an allocator uh, stored in the polymorphic allocator delete. We got another copy of the allocator in data. We have the allocator data member, and then we have the unique pointer. So we got one, two, three, four uh, pointers to the same allocator or to the same memory resource, four allocators, plus the one in vector, so that's five. Um, and we, there's no way we can get rid of the one in vector, but we can see if we can consolidate the rest of these ones here. All right, so what we'll do is instead of using a unique pointer, we'll just use a plain old pointer. So the difference here is now we're just constructing the pointer directly and in the destructor, now that now we have a custom one, if d bar, because we're doing Sean Parent style, then we'll, we'll go ahead and destroy the pointer's resources. So now we're reusing uh, get allocator, well, the get allocator function, which points directly to the d allocator members. And now uh, we're back from 24 to 16 bytes. Um, the drawback here is that in order to remove this copy of the allocator, we've traded away some safety, right? We no longer have the unique pointer to our benefit. We've got to make sure we do this right. And what happens if destroy throws an exception? Don't accept those types. Don't accept those types? Well, I mean, you can no accept this thing, but you'd still leak. 
Yeah, so you, you'd get a program crash, and then presumably it will take care of the deallocation if it crashes. <laughs> All right. So another thing we can do is we can have bar nine have a get allocator function because we know this string has it. Uh, so we, we can pull out of it. So get underscore allocator, that's the convention that all the standard containers use. And now foo9, its get allocator function just calls bars get allocator. So now we can get rid of the allocator member. So that's pretty cool. Um, and now we're back to eight bytes from 16. So this is generally the kind of thing that you do uh, when you're working with polymorphic allocators. You want to make sure you don't have, have as few redundant copies as you can, um, and that way you don't have to uh, pay the consequences of like a bloated object. Okay, so allocator awareness, best practices. This probably doesn't cover them all. These were the ones I could think of uh, when I was working through this. First, fix your allocators at construction. Right? As soon as you have an allocator, do not change it. Your object, you initialize it with that allocator, don't change it in the middle of operation. There be dragons that way. Don't do it. You pass an allocator argument to the constructor, the copy constructor, the move constructor, the move copy constructor, and generally what you do is you take that allocator and you pass it to your data members. Uh, make sure you have your dirty little secret move constructor. Otherwise, you're gonna have terrible performance if you try to put this thing into a standard vector. Um, you have this uh, allocator type, um, member type, so that you can tell the rest of the system that you're opting into allocator awareness. Your get allocator returns the allocator pass in the constructor. Please don't return something else. Uh, you delegate to data members for the allocator storage. Now, if you have like seven data members and they all have their own allocator storage, there's really not much you can do about it, right? But you can save yourself um, by just delegating to one of the data members. Always use global storage if you're going to be setting the default allocator and set the default allocator only in main. And I will add a little note. John Lenko says, please don't set the default allocator unless in production code. Um, this is something just for test drivers. And if you're going to do it, do it at compile time on the link line so that everybody gets the J something malloc or whatever. So it's just a replacement of the underlying allocator. Yeah, and the comment was that if you do, like in production, want to replace the allocator, it should be like a library which overwrites the C++, Redefine. def redefines the, the standard allocator. Like if you want to use TC malloc or whatever, that would be what you would do. All right. So. Let's move forward. Uh, I kind of punched a little bit on move semantics. Now we're going to get to it. So let's say you have this function here. Uh, it returns a std PMR vector int, and this has this result type, which is initialized with some allocator, and it returns the result. Now we have std PMR vector int v equals f. Now we have std PMR vector int w, and then w equals f being called. What allocator does V have and what allocator does W have? V uses some allocator and W uses the default allocator. Correct. V uses some allocator and W uses the default allocator. It's pretty subtle. It's easy to get wrong. Can anybody explain why that is? Or does anybody not know why that is? OK. So the reason is that when I have v equals f, v is going to be what the std vector ints move constructor is going to be called. And remember that PMR's dirty little secret that the move constructor will take a copy of the allocator of the thing on the right-hand side of the equal sign. It will not be called. Yeah, it's, it's, it won't be called. So the comment is, it won't be called. What, what won't be called? Because you have name. Yeah, uh, you're supposed to be get the instructions of the callers back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's never moved. In our view. It's, 
Oh, well, hold on, hold on. Yes, 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 yes. I should have mentioned that. Yes, you could, ha I mean, this return value optimization can do this. Assume that return value optimization isn't so working for this case. Uh, no, you're not guaranteed because you don't know what dot, dot, dot has. So there. Um, <laughs> but at best, you're going to get, uh, or at worst, you're going to get the move constructor being called. And the move constructor, PMR's dirty little secret, it will uh, initialize with that allocator. Now this one, when I construct W, it uses the default allocator. And the allocator can't change after something is constructed. So here, this is just doing a copy. Mm -hmm. And it's not, uh, it's not changing the allocator. So that's why V has some allocator and W has the default allocator. Um, all right. So given this, do you want to pass in the allocator of the return value? So you could. So for every function, you could pass in the allocator that you want the return value to have. Um, so here, v is being, is being initialized, and f is being called with some allocator. So that means v is going to have some allocator. You could have w being initialized with some allocator. And then when I call f and I assign it, I want to make sure that I call f with some allocator in case there's some kind of like really efficient uh, move for that allocator. Uh, what about x? What happens in this statement? What allocator does x have? The default, the default allocator. Whoops. It's not obvious, right? <laughs> By looking at the code, that that's going to have the default allocator, um, unless you're very careful about it. So I don't really like this option. I think that it's error prone. It depends on the dirty little secret. And allocators are involved in almost every function call. Every function which returns an object which, is allocate, which, which has, allocates memory or whatever um, is going to take in this extra parameter. That can have performance costs. Um, it certainly has development costs. So what about this? Pass in a by pointer or reference. Right, so now f takes in a pointer to a vector, and I initialize my vector with a default allocator. I call f, and it fills it in, or w with some allocator, and it fills it in. What do you guys think about that option? Mm, I thought we I, left that in 98 or something. <laughs> uh, so I, I hear some grumbling. So yeah, it's not too good either. Um, you get this like two-stage initialization which we used to do back in you know, 98 days, where we would create our object and then call a whole bunch of functions to fill in its data. Uh, we lose const because generally when you create an object, you, you're going to have to create it first and then call some functions to modify it. So you can't just have like const a vector of whatever equals whatever anymore. Um, so that can potentially impact the safety of your code. Uh, also, in my mind, it, it kind of makes the reasonability of the code a little bit more difficult. There's a reason why we moved away from that such a long time ago. Um, unfortunately, those are the two options. Neither of them are very nice. Oh, there's a comment. There's a third option. Of, I should know. These are the two options that I'm aware of. What's the third option? You take it by value and you default initialize it. So you can move initialize the value. It'll get the correct, with an empty vector, for instance. You can move initialize the return value that or you can just, you know, oh, so the comment is that you can move initialize the value that you pass as a parameter. Oh, man. And the comment is you lose RVO because it's a parameter. Yes, but you get moved back. Uh, so I, I'm not sure that that option, I would consider it any better than the other two. Um, So if you don't care, you don't pass it if you do care. So, so I don't have that code up here, so I'm not going to be able to analyze it just based on what you're saying. We can talk about it after and see if it's a better option. I'm not, I'm not entirely happy with either, either anything I've seen so far. I just want to mention that 
this program is just because polymorphic allocator does not propagate on container smooth copy assignments, and I think it's it's a better trade-off if it was. This uh, if it will propagate on container. I know what you think. Of so the comment is that we wouldn't have this problem if the allocator was propagated with moves. That, though, creates a whole other slew of problems. Um, and and that's the, the reason why the standardization com committee went with this approach is because the, there's more dragons along those other things. Um, we can d discuss more of that afterwards, but that is actually a very dangerous thing. So, so this is just, these are the implications of PMR. I mean, this is what you got to do. And then there's the user cost. This code here, some string s equals move of some data type dot some data member. Prior to PMR, this was a safe thing, right? You just know that the thing on the right hand side is in, you know, some kind of uh, unspecified state. You know, at worst it would be like destructible only, and the thing on the left hand side is good to go. However, because of std PMR's dirty little secret, I could be pulling the allocator out of this thing, and potentially the, this allocator dies when some data type dies. And then I have a dangling uh, pointer underneath that. So that's, that's one of the pieces of impact. Let's say I have a cool thing here. Yep, question? Uh, so the comment was the usual pattern, you could put the closing print before the dot. Uh, I don't think that makes a difference here. It'll, it'll still use PMR's dirty little secret. You said that the issue is that if you move the allocator from the right hand side to the left hand side, then it could die. Does this mean that it's not a handle life allocator, but it's doing a little bit more than that? Ah, so yeah, great question. Uh, I, I think I probably misstated it. So the problem is not that the allocator dies of this thing. Okay. The problem is if some data type has a memory resource. Oh, okay. And then when some data type goes out of scope, if that happens before this thing goes out of scope, now we're, we're in trouble. All right, so now to the cool thing. Here we have a string, a vector of int. Just imagine some kind of like buffer application here. Uh, and the idea is you fill up the buffer, and then every once in a while you call flush, and it sends the buffer out by calling std move of debuffer. Now, someone goes in and says, hey, I just saw a std PMR allocator talk. I can do some cool stuff with this. And what they do is they create a monotonic buffer resource called D resource. Yo, so cool. And basically they said, well, I know that this buffer is never really going to use more than a thousand bytes. So I can make this more efficient potentially by taking this buffer, and uh, which is the string here, and using this resource. But then they forget to update the other part of the code right here, and then send buffer is called with the moved buffer. And now this thing is using the memory re resource, which is in the cool thing, and cool thing will probably go out of scope, and now, boom, you got a dangling pointer. Very, very easy to misuse these things. Now there's another issue here, which is development cost. Uh, if you want to go std PMR all the way, you want to make everything allocator aware. So here's a simple struct. It has an int. And it has a vector. The int is assigned to 0. The vector is assigned to empty thing. This, these are the defaults for it. Then you can use this and do all kinds of stuff. In order to make this thing allocator aware, um, such that it has all the same performance that this one has, because we get a lot for free with this, right? We get move constructor, move assignment. Like it, It's great. In order to make this thing allocator aware, you have to do all this. It didn't even fit on the slide, Like not even close. So if, if, if you have developers that are coming from another language and you tell them that they need to write code like this when what they really want is this, they're going to revolt. So that's a very serious cost. And don't forget, 
that all this code, which doesn't fit on the slide, is going to need tests, which certainly don't fit on a slide. Not fun. Now, when it comes to standard, standard support, there are some things that support this very well. Containers, string, tuple, they're all allocator aware. Then there are some notable things that do not support allocators at all. Variant, std function, neither of these things support allocators. So basically, when you build your allocator awareness through this object and all these sub-objects and whatever, all these data members, when you hit one of these suckers, you just hit a brick wall. And uh, you can't go further beyond that. Well, you can try to hack something up to make it work. It's not going to be pretty. So, yeah. Come. Although, uh, in like functions case and a handful of other types, uh, it's come up in lube quite a few times now that we have pretty strong proof that you just cannot add allocators to type erased types. Ah, so the comment is that you just can't add allocators to type erased types. I think that that is true for allocators as general, but not true for polymorphic allocators in particular. So you it's not true for function, for example, because function doesn't have to be implemented as type erased. It can be implemented much better. Much much more practically than it is right now. Ah, you okay. Have that implementation already in Windows. Right. So so the comment was is that you can implement function without using type erasure in a different way to where you could get the allocator support. I haven't dug deep into like what it would take these to make these things allocator where, at least with variant, uh, uh, Alistair Mer Meredith has told me that you can implement a uh, variant with an allocator support. Mm -hmm. um, and I would just take what he says on, upon authority. Yeah, All right. So just to mention some of the drawbacks, <laughs> we, we covered the, the benefits at the beginning. You lose return by value. You lose single step initialization, const. Uh, sometimes it's wasteful with memory. Uh, there are tricky exception safety re uh, issues. Uh, you lose your move construction, move assignment connection because of the dirty little secret. Uh, there's lots of boilerplate uh, support, or lots of boilerplate required, and there's spotty standard support. So there are alternatives to this. One of them is to use an object pool. Depending on what your memory access patterns look like, an object pool actually makes a lot of sense in, in these scenarios when you might be looking for allocators. This is kind of a, a typical case. You could use custom data types. So allocators are kind of a blunt instrument. Uh, you can take it and throw it at a problem. But if you happen to know the memory access patterns on a more granular level than all these are generally accessed together, you can make custom data types that are screaming fast. Um, so my personal opinion is that you can probably get both higher performance and a lower total cost using custom data types for uh, the places in your code base that you actually need it. And the reason why it'd be a lower cost is because doing allocators everywhere, making everything uh, be allocator supported, that cost is tremendous. Whereas if you just spend the time and the cost on these very particular situations where you need it, you get better performance. And I don't think that the cost is going to be higher than, uh, than doing allocators everywhere. Just my opinion. So that's the conclusion of the talk. Uh, we have some time for questions now. So I, I came in a few minutes late, and I missed the slide with the probe. <laughs> the <more> I <laughs> if you don't mind, please put up a slide with the probe. To me, this is like a no-brainer no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the question is, when do you use it? The comment was, all I see are cons. Um, So I haven't seen a, a case where I thought allocators are definitely, it, this definitely makes me want to use allocators like throughout my entire code base. Um, I haven't seen a problem where I wanted to optimize something where I thought I would rather do allocators than custom data types that are like more efficient based on my memory access patterns. Um, the thing that's nice about allocators is that they are a blunt instrument. If you have a completely allocator aware code base, you can just like throw a, uh, an allocator which uh, works only on a single thread, and you just you get that performance benefit, right? It's, it's just kind of easy. Um, everything you just said was that about <coughs> 17 PMR allocators in specific, or about 
allocated in general? Ah, so everything that I just said, is it about uh, PMR allocators in specific or allocators in general? Um, I'm just going to say, assuming a world of where PMR allocators are the thing, that's where, where I'm coming from. Right? They're, allocators, as in general, I don't fully understand like, all the possible crazy things that they can do. There may be like, cool stuff to do with that. But just like, from a general code base standard, the proposition of take everything and make it allocator aware, and then you get access to this extra functionality, that's the thing where I'm, mm, I'm not really seeing the benefit. I don't see that as, uh, as a great thing. I guess the question is, do, do all these costs apply to allocators in the type system? And do all these costs apply to allocators in the type system? I don't think so. Um, I, I, for example, the dirty little secret that doesn't have to apply to allocators in the type system because you generally can only do move construction when the thing on the right-hand side has the exact same allocators on the left-hand side. You know that at compile time. So there could be some benefits to that, but it's still so terrible that I don't know if I'd want to use it. When would you pick this over allocators in the type system? The question is, when would I pick this, put, pick this over allocators in the type system? Um, I'm still not at a place to where I would pick allocators in the type system, so it's kind of hard for me to compare. Any other questions or comments? Oh, that was easy. Well, I, oh. I mean, your coworker here was very adamant to point out that we never change the default allocator and all that stuff. The implication was that you did implement this in some place of your code base. I want I'm still trying to get the pro for for the gentleman in the back. Um or I was reading too much into all that. So uh, there's a question of you know, did we implement this in our code base? So we definitely did not implement <coughs> std PMR, but we've implemented something which is quite similar okay. on, on a quite large scale. Um, so a lot of this is coming from the experience of uh, working with that kind of a system. Can you talk to the benefits of that a little bit, of that implementation, your implementation? Uh, the benefits of... much easier to track down certain types of bugs. Because then you can uh, plug in an allocator which knows all your allocations, and you can track down what, what's happening. So the comment was that if you can plug in an allocator at the start of your program, that can facilitate discovery of uh, bugs. And that's absolutely true. So. Uh, TC malloc is one such like allocation library. You just add dash l TC malloc, you call your, you start your program with some environmental parameters, and then you get all kinds of information on uh, what kinds of where allocations happening relative to the stack and stuff like that. So that's the case, but that's kind of like an independent thing of polymorphic allocators. That's just replacing the global allocator in general. Oh, go ahead. is that allocators are specifically, as far as I understand them, the dependency injection of this is where you get memory for the standard library. You having the luxury of do you, doing your own type, it's a luxury, right? If you need a dynamically selected allocator for a bunch of your standard library types, there's no other way to get it. So yeah, if you're if you can't write your own types, then here's a way. Here's something that you can do at least. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's yeah, absolutely I mean, true. This, this, this thing takes uh, all kinds of parameters in the constructor. This the thing function. is super easy to use if you just need to use it in a very limited space with some type that you just need to throw on the table, and somebody else has already written everything for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the, the thing is, they have PMR is in the standard library. These types are 
supposed to be in the sandbox. <laughs> uh, so you can just put them together, and as long as you, these abstractions don't leak outside of the module, you're fine. So. Or, or you could use them to write your own site. <laughs> or, or you could do that, yes. But you, you can't do that because you have to select them at runtime, like you have to when you're doing, like, I don't know, GPU allocation. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, like, listing up the whole system by overriding new and delete uh, and things like that just seems like a much easier way to get debuggability and some of the speed in a lot of these questions as opposed to using this model. And at EA, when we had our own sites as well, we experienced a very similar problem to what he's experienced. We beat a similar thing on a large scale, had a lot of trouble with it, and ended up doing some other tricky things at our library level, our HPSCI. Um, so the comment was is that uh, at EA, uh, there's some similar kind of experience and in the, in, in the results are similar. similar. Like Some thoughts about uh, using a thread local variable uh, allocator kind of mechanism. I have a quick observation and an important question. The quick observation is, if we get metatasks, development cost would be zero. Because we could have an allocator aware metatask and it just generates all the good stuff. So, so the comment was is that meta classes it can generate all this stuff for you. And that also points to, there's been some discussion about having a language feature which does the boilerplate, because if you can get, scrap the boilerplate, it certainly helps things uh, with the balance. But with stood met, with, but meta classes, um, I think I heard uh, a year when that's gonna come out, I think it was 20, 30 or something. Yeah, yeah. Who, who knows what, what things are gonna look like then? Who knows what specifically meta classes will actually be able to accomplish? Uh, we'll see. I have an important question though. Oh. How, how do pairs and tuple interact if you have multiple PMR types inside the system? So the question is how do pair and tuple interact if you have multiple PMR things inside? How you would expect? Can you, can you pass with an allocator? <laughs> can is, you is pair allocator aware? Can I pass the allocator to pair and it just gets propagated everywhere? Uh, can you pass the allocator to pair and it gets propagated everywhere? Uh, I believe the answer to that is yes. Yeah. So is it PMR pair? No, just stood pair. Overriding like malloc and and three and you know, not a state now it's fine so you guys are different high performance allocator but um, oftentimes you'll care about um, allocator support if you're doing something like you want to have some stood vector to that gets uh, allocated from uh, shared memory yeah. um, like I, I just see memory or like GPU memory or something else like that yeah. Yeah. Uh, in that case it's really more about capability yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, that, that said. Um, I, I, my library uh, has a different broken in different ways for this allocator model. Um, and uh, we don't really know what, what to do with it. Um, and kind of a problem for us, um, we looked at this stuff um, and we, we, we don't think this would going to be any better. So I, I, I mean, I thought at first it was crazy when, uh, when we had suggested that maybe we need a language feature for this. but. Maybe it's not so crazy. Did you hear Alan's Eric talk? So, so there was a, a comment that um, that maybe it isn't so crazy to add a language feature mm -hmm. for something like this. It's, it's I agree. Short, short I just wanted to definitively answer the question of why there, there are positives. So the very short answer is we have demonstrated that under certain circumstances, the performance benefits of allocators, especially for reusable libraries, is dramatic. And if it's already done for you, you have a large population, you're talking about a small infrastructure relative to the population, there is a value proposition that exists. The three things that allocators add are, when you need performance, allocators give it to you all the way down to the standard types. They also allow you to place objects in particular uh, locations for embedded systems or if you have memory mapped I.O. 
or whatever else you need to do when an object has to go somewhere. It's more than just placement new because the object itself will allocate memory and it has to propagate. And the third one, which we didn't ma mention, is instrumentation. And so you can actually look into systems and, and see where memory is being used. And to see this all discussed, I would say uh, uh, YouTube, uh, local arena, memory allocators, and meeting C++ November 2017. Uh, so I'll, I'll repeat the last part of what you said, John, which is for a good exposition of the benefits of the allocators provide you, uh, there's a talk called Local Arena Allocators. Local Arena Memory Allocators. Uh, local Arena Memory Allocators. Meeting C++. Meeting C++. Two, November 2017 in Berlin. November 2017 in Berlin. Um, I, just, I, I, I do want to uh, like agree with John here. I mean, I think that at a high level in the abstract, I think we can all agree that being able to control how allocation is done in your program can be a powerful tool. Um, whether or not we figured out the right answer to that C++ separate issue. But um, I, I, I mean, I think there's a, there's a lot of literature out there. John's done a number of good talks on this, but um, it's a very common thing to do to want to control how allocation is done in your application for some application specific um, way. So, so the comment is that, uh, that in general, there's agreement that being able to control allocation is a good idea and there's definitely utility uh, use for this kind of thing. And I, I totally agree with that. This particular rendering has these particular consequences. Yeah. There could be other renderings which, uh, which are more interesting. And I think there probably will be. What do you think we should do with, about std PMR? Now the question is, what do, you, what do I think we should do about std PMR? Uh, I think that the first thing to do would be to give a talk on the costs. And <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure what to do after that. So, 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 <laughs> uh, it, se it seems to me like, like uh, and I know Arthur's given a talk about um, scary things with the PMR before um, that terrified me as much as this one. It seems to me like uh, a lot of the scenarios comes from a set default resource. Um, what, why, if, if, if that was gone, would, how, how, how much, how many of these problems would go away if you could not set the default? So th the question is, if you couldn't set the default resource, how many of these problems would go away? I would say maybe one out of 10. You wouldn't be able to test it. Uh, I'm, fi I'm fine with that section. Oh, sure. All right, so I, I think time's up. Uh, thank you, guys. <laughs>